I think you alluded to MRI, and although you didn't state it explicitly, were you talking about hippocampal volume or other uh, brain matter loss? Was that kind of what you were getting at? Yeah, the typical things that we look for in an MRI <clears throat> when evaluating for dementia, A, is ruling out vascular disease or quantifying the amount of it. So we all get with aging some amount of tiny little strokes. And I know that sounds scary, um, but as we get older, you know, for various reasons, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, smoking, diabetes, and even just normal aging, there can be blocking of blood vessels, um, changes in circulation that cause us to have these tiny little infarcts. These are not anything you would notice. You would never have symptoms. You wouldn't go to the hospital, but um, there can be an accumulation of them. And there's a certain amount that's sort of normal when it's extremely mild or scattered, but then when they start to you know, coalesce or they start to extend into cortical areas, um, parts of the brain that sort of matter more in terms of critical thinking, um, then they can be symptomatic. So that's one of the things that we look at is how much vascular disease. Another thing that we look at is how much shrinking there is, both globally and then, as you mentioned, in the hippocampus, um, which is where short-term memories are kind of formed and before they go off elsewhere. And so um, there is, you know, it is known that, that shrinking in the hippocampus, particularly um, disproportionately to shrinking elsewhere, can be a biomarker of Alzheimer's disease. Now, there are sometimes people who have hippocampal atrophy and turn out to be amyloid negative. Um, so there are these other pathologies um, that could be considered, um, they call it hippocampal sclerosis. Some people have that from a, a stroke. Some people have it potentially from chronic traumatic encephalopathy and other, other um buildup of other abnormal proteins beside amyloid in the brain that can affect memory as well. I want to come back to the amyloid negative case in a second. Um, is hippocampal volume a reliable marker to um, check progress? So for example, mm -hmm. If you had a patient that was high risk, theoretically, so I don't know if you're seeing people who are high risk but don't have symptoms yet, but if you had a patient who was high risk, you did an MRI, you got a baseline, so to speak, you had their hippocampal volume, would tracking that over time for changes, reductions, presumably, would that provide any meaningful insight? Sometimes, but not always. So other things can affect hippocampal volume, for example, um, people who are uh, chronically exposed to elevated levels of cortisol or stress hormone, you know, who people who have post-traumatic stress disorder, we know they have smaller hippocampi than people who don't have that. And so it, there are times when we can track hippocampal volume over the course of progression of Alzheimer's and the shrinking sort of correlates with the amount of cognitive impairment, but sometimes not. You know, sometimes we have people who are very impaired and their brain doesn't really look that bad. And sometimes we have people who look like they shouldn't be able to, you know, put on their own pants <laughs> based on what the brain looks like, but they seem fine. So it's again, one of those things that really has to be taken in context with all of the other information. And part of the reason why the, the clinical evaluation and interview and the intangible stuff is so important. And just to be clear, the diagnosis is, it requires the clinical story with or without amyloid. And so when you look at the Venn diagram of people with amyloid and people with clinical symptoms suggestive of dementia and you line them up, there's an overlap, but it's not a perfect union. And what that tells That's us correct. is that amyloid is neither necessary nor sufficient for Alzheimer's disease, correct? Well, amyloid is necessary for Alzheimer's disease. It's not necessary for dementia. But, you know, if you look at the definition pathologically of what Alzheimer's is, it is the 
plaques, the, uh, the amyloid plaques and the tau tangles in the brain. So, you know, that was what's required pathologically to make a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. But that diagnosis will only be made post-mortem, technically? Technically, yeah. Um, but that's why the advent of amyloid imaging has been so helpful in terms of um, making that formal diagnosis in living people, um, which is obviously more helpful mm -hmm. <laughs> for them. Um, you know, the correlation, I, I believe in one of the studies with um, Amivid, uh, Florbetapir, which was one of the first amyloid imaging uh, ligands that came out, the correlation between the PET and their, th these were people who were kind enough to donate their brains after they passed to compare to what their PET scan looked like. And it was a correlation was about 97%. So meaning when they were alive, they had an amyloid PET scan. Yes. And an amyloid PET scan, unlike FDG PET, where you're putting radio labeled glucose, here you're putting an antibody to amyloid on, as their tracer, correct? Yes. And so they had this scan while they were alive and you then had a distribution of people that had you know this much amyloid, that much amyloid, et cetera. But all of them, to be clear, had a definite had a, had a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease based clinically, correct? Right. They had a, a suspected diagnosis of Alzheimer's, and then they underwent the PET, and then then they donated their brains. And, and then on the exam, correlation between. Yeah. So the, what we're missing there, of course, is the control of people who had amyloid in their brains that would go on to have amyloid on autopsy, but didn't have Alzheimer's disease. Do we have a rough sense of? how big a population that is. I've had a hard time finding this, by the way. Um, what percentage of people on autopsy have amyloid in their brain, but did not have dementia during their life? Um, I don't know, honestly. Um, but I think more than you would expect because, so what we know about amyloid and one of the reasons that amyloid imaging has been so helpful is because it's helped us understand that amyloid starts to build up 10, 15, 20 years before you start to have symptoms of for forgetfulness and other cognitive symptoms. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, it's this process where, you know, it's occurring and then it reaches a critical mass. And there's a lot of debate scientifically about what that critical mass is or what the downstream effects of amyloid buildup. There's some people who think that you can have as much amyloid as you want, and it's not until you start to have tau. Um, we're understanding more that tau, whereas amyloid is sort of widespread kind of from the beginning and builds up all these years beforehand. Um, and so the, the tracking amyloid doesn't correlate to symptoms. Tau, on the other hand, is very different and has a very specific um, pattern in which it spreads that does indeed correlate with symptoms. So some people feel like it's really the tau that kind of stages where things are and whether you're going to be symptomatic or not. So to answer your question, you know, I think there are a lot of people, you know, who start to build up amyloid maybe in their 70s or whatever and then, you know, die of something else. So, so a way to think about it is it's sort of like saying, and this is a bad example, but I think it's the best one I can think of on the spot. It's like coronary calcification yeah. where if somebody dies of cancer and you see calcification in their coronary arteries, you knew they have atherosclerosis, but it never, it may have never clinically manifested itself. And they, if they had not died of cancer, they may have died of an MI 10 years later. That's exactly right. And that's frankly the, um, analogy we most often like to use, you know, when, so before 2011, um, the FDA, you know, the, the definition of Alzheimer's was dementia. So there was no place f in research for these prodromal patients or, you know, testing these interventions in people before they had full-blown dementia. And that was very much like waiting till someone had a heart attack 
to say that they had coronary artery disease. Well, and it's like, no, you knew that because they have high cholesterol and they were building up and you could see on an angioplasty or whatever, you know, that this was happening. And so in 2011, with the advent of amyloid imaging, you know, Pittsburgh compound was the first thing that came out that allowed us to see that, although its half-life is so terribly short that it really is not clinically um, useful because it has to be made and used within minutes. Um, but you know that really allowed us to redefine what Alzheimer's is so that we could see this amyloid building up in patients before they started to have symptoms. And, and it allowed you know, some redefinition and there were white papers that came out kind of dividing. And I know um, on a previous podcast, uh, Richard Isaacson did go into this in some detail, but you know, the preclinical phase of Alzheimer's then mild cognitive impairment, and then dementia. Um, so it really has allowed us to then kind of take a step back and see if we can intervene before people have these symptoms that we may not be able to reverse. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about, where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies.